Good evening, Chairman Jakar, Vice Chair Johnson, and C members of the committee. My name is Tim Wilkerson. I'm Vice President and Policy Counsel of the New England Cable and Telecommunications Association, NECTA. We are a five-state regional trade association, trade association representing substantially all private cable broadband companies with our footprint. <coughs> NECTA's Rhode Island um, members annually invest over $50 million a year and over the past decade have invested over $500 million and uh, employed over 850 uh, residents of Rhode Island. I think that I should start tonight, and I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity, but I think I should start tonight by saying there's a lot of misinformation surrounding this, this important policy debate. And I think, Mr. Chairman, I think in a question you posed earlier to, um, to Matt Brill, I think you hit the issue right on the head. Why are we here? And what do the ISPs believe, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the FCC, what happened in uh, December, and now what the ripple effect has been, both at the federal level, but more importantly at the state level? I've provided written testimony, and I want to point out uh, an exhibit. And this is an exhibit to actually an FTC chairman under Obama, the Obama administration, um, John D. Woods, testified recently in Connecticut. Um, opposing similar net neutrality legislation. And he uses this slide, which I think is highly effective, in the blue, which starts in 1996 and then reappears today. In the blue is the um, internet we have today and the regulatory authority over the internet which we have today. The red is the two years of Chairman Wheeler, the FCC Democratic Chair, um, Title II regulations. And the reason why our industry supported Chairman Pai's decision in, in December to repeal the Title II regulations is simple. Not because of net neutrality, but because for those two short years, the FCC regulated um, internet service providers as common carriers, which is a 1936 law that was originally established for telephone companies. So the chairman actually spoke earlier about looking forward. The chairman Wheeler so-called net neutrality regulations in their totality were a backward looking, archaic 1930s regulatory regime for a 21st century cutting edge futuristic innovation driver, the internet. Our industry has pushed so hard to end this regulatory ping pong that's gone back and forth between first Chairman um, Wheeler under the last two years of Obama, so under six years of President Obama, you had the same laws you have today, the same regulatory authority you have today, but those two years under um, Chairman Wheeler, under Title II, the internet was regulated similar to a telephone company in the 1930s. Chairman Pai comes in, independent of who the President of the United States is, if Jeb Bush had become President or any other Republican, he, may, he probably most likely would have appointed a G. Pius, the chair of the FCC. December, he comes down with his decision, reversing what Tom Wheeler did, and he did so in such a way, and the FCC did such, in such a way, so drastically and so clearly saying, we do not have the regulatory authority over the internet anymore on purpose. Why? And this is your question earlier, Mr. Chairman. Forcing Congress's hand to pass a law, to pass a modern, uniform, and durable law that clearly says three things in particular. No throttling, no blocking, no discrimination of the internet. And that's what our companies for the last eight years have publicly and strenuously pledged. And it's more than a pledge. It's part of our operating DNA. Because if we violate those three tenets in 2010, 2012, 2015, or today, there are, four, there are four entities, which Matt Brill mentioned before, who have come down on us, investigate us, and bring enforcement actions. Here in the state, it's your Attorney General, under Consumer Protection Law, the Federal Trade Commission, the uh, FCC still retains some authority, and the Department of Justice. All three have existing authority today, regardless of what happened in December, to come after any illegal activity if we violate any of those three tenets. We have public, in, starting in 2010, we had to make publicly um, disclo public disclosures saying what our 
what our practices are on those three uh, those three business practices in our oper in our business operations. And clearly, we've said we will not do anything that we've been alleged to do today on throttling, blocking, and uh, discrimination. If we have, there is a rigorous and pretty lengthy um, record, particularly in the FTC, the federal cop on the beat, to, to enforce, bring enforcement actions to protect consumers. And I would like to state that what you've heard primarily tonight about violations have been wireless companies, and not um, our members um, primarily. I think um, one person mentioned the Comcast um, case. I think that's really instructive of where we are and where we've been and where we're going in the future. The FTC brought an action against the FCC, I mean, excuse me, against um, Comcast on a case called BitTorrent. And BitTorrent, if you remember, was file sharing. It was state-of-the-art technology that young people, like the, the, the sponsor of the bill who, um, who spoke earlier, probably somebody in their basement created this technology to allow people to share movies, songs, but much of it was illegal. It was a violation of copyright. But in a neighborhood, if you and I were, were file sharing on BitTorrent, and you were sending me movies and I was sending you movies, back in 2012, for, forgive me if that's the wrong date, the pipe of the internet was so small that you and I dominated all of this neighborhood. So all these people and all these consumers who were trying to access the internet, go online, look at um, the Providence Journal, look at some other website, were, were slowed down because of us. So what Comcast did was slow our traffic down to permit everyone else who was doing pregnant, all lawful activity, slowing down our illegal activity to make sure the experience that these people enjoyed and that they paid for and they rightfully deserved happened. The FTC came down and said to Comcast, illegal. So what has happened in response? Comcast has ensured that the pipe has gotten larger and larger and larger and larger. There will be no throttling, no blocking, no discrimination because we have all, both legally and what we expect, is the experience on the internet should not be changed, should not be manipulated by a company. And all of our companies believe that. And it's a pledge that we make both legally and um, because it's the right thing to do. Next. All major ISPs, whether they belong to NECTA or not, are committed to having Congress act in a bipartisan way to pass a durable law that's uniform. I think a couple times you've heard, um, you've heard, you've heard testimony where 83% of the public wants a bill to be um, passed. And Representative O'Grady asked a great question. Why do we have any hope that Congress is going to pass a law? I'd say there's two reasons. One, because of that 83%. Democrats and Republicans want uniform, a uniform playing field for the internet, for ISP providers and consumers to make sure that their experience is not affected. And also, too, all across the country, hearings like this are happening. There are towns passing resolutions asking you to act because it's the right thing to do. And I would argue that, yes, it should happen. It should happen at the federal level. And as much as there's a space and there's a need and there's a fear of what could happen, I would ask you to take a step back and think and look at the facts and look at what the law is. And the law is today, we violate these mandates, we are going to be, we are going to be, or we're going to be investigated, and there's going to be enforcement action against us. I, I, I enjoy the, the, the idea that, that we are the big bad internet, and we're large corporations that are going to discriminate against people. And I want to very briefly say, we are the pipeline that consumers and businesses use the internet. We are merely the means that the Facebooks, the Googles, what are called edge providers, but also very small companies, that only have one employee or public or public entities like libraries use our platform to interact with each other, with consumers, and with businesses. And I think sometimes it gets lost in the discussion is who is driving content, who's controlling content. We are the pipe that moves content. And if we pledge to you that we're not going to affect how that, that content moves, we are not the ones who are going to Stifle First Amendment rights. Stifle political. What candidates. are you going to do with the um, with this net neutrality of the field? What are you? If you're not going to right. say all this, you're not going to do it. What are you going to do? So, what do we want? What do we want? What, why, why is it so attractive for these companies to have the FCC in the field? 
because of that ping pong. And I don't know if you may, you may, have, you may not have heard me that Chairman Wheeler imposed one set of rules that were full back related, 1930s style regulation, treating us like a telephone company. We want the future, but we want a clear, predictable, uniform set of laws that we are going to act under, that, that are going to govern us. Because nothing should change. When I forget the date, because it honestly it does not matter to me what date those regs go into effect. I think it might be April 23rd. Nothing will change from all of your experience if you remember if you use our company, uh, our, our our internet, or any other major ISP. Because to do so would be it would be it would be business suicide. It really would be, and it's illegal. Because that's the other thing that people don't take into consideration. You have a Comcast, for instance. Cox is a privately held company, so I'll use Comcast as an example. Publicly held company. Trade stocks. Look at Facebook yesterday. Look what happened when there was when when Cambridge Analytica comes out. And that story comes out that they that they were mishandling data, personal data. Their stock fell seven percent. The the stock market itself fell, fell four hundred points. That was the headline on the news yesterday. What would happen if Comcast all of a sudden said we're going to pick winners and losers, and we're going to pick all Democrats, we're going to pick all Republicans, we're going to slow down their their internet traffic on the twenty fourth of April? Their stock would plummet, and it would be the headline in the news. And so that's what I, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that's the reality. Despite what the fears are, and there are a lot of fears, and some of them are really found, founded. Yesterday's, um, and I'm not picking on Facebook at all, but that kind of idea of what privacy is and how we deal with, with data, those are the questions that we need to be dealing with going forward. Not about how traffic is going to be routed on the internet when there are clear, clear rules today, and there will be on the 24th of, of uh, April. Questions for Tim Williams. Sorry, I no. Tim Wilkerson. Mr. Wilkerson, you said absolutely nothing will change, but it, some of the testimony I, I heard clearly that there was going to be various fear that had been expressed in one way or another, and the cost of putting small businesses out of business is one of those fears. But you're standing before us and you're saying there will be absolutely no change. So how is it that these individuals are presenting that facts, I would right. say, and you are just presenting the complete opposite? I, I, I'll use the most sophisticated example, and I'll use a, a very simple answer. You look at the libraries in the state, and look at the schools and other similar public institutions. There are thousands of them in the state, and I know, for instance, Cox provides low or free internet access to over a thousand of those. For, and you heard the, 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 the lady from the Library Association just speak. What do you think she would do if on the 24th of April, all of a sudden her internet stopped, or was slowed down? She's gonna, she's gonna call all of you and say, see, see what they did? And you know what you should say? Call the Attorney General and have them investigate. Call the FTC, because contrary to what the gentleman said, and I have provided, I think I mentioned this, um, FTC Chairman um, Leibowitz's testimony to you in my exhibit, there are four entities that will come down on Cox or Verizon or whomever as an ISP. And then let's look at, and some people say, yeah, but you're going to keep the person in the basement down. You're not going to allow them to flourish. You're not going to let them to become the next Facebook. Well, if you look at Netflix, Netflix today has over 120 million subscribers worldwide. Comcast, one of the giants on uh, uh, ISPs, have 22 million. So they have five times too many subscribers. I don't do math. I'm a lawyer, so if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Five times, 22 to 120. The idea that they, that this little guy, and Comcast, a little guy compared to, to Netflix, is going to, is going to manipulate or control their business is, in, is not only crazy, but now two points. One, Netflix puts out an annual speed index, a global speed index for all ISPs. And they say in the evening, who are the fastest ISPs in the world? The world. So there's a ton of ISPs around the world. Comcast is number one. Cox is number two out of the entire world. So when, when Netflix is a fledgling little competitor and they're growing the giant that they are today, I believe on, I know on Comcast and I believe on Cox, if you're talking to talking remote, Netflix comes right up. 
So not only did they not block them, they partnered with them. Because that's what the ISPs understand, that all of us are changing the way we, we watch our video, handheld devices, on laptops, but it's also the content that we're getting is changing. It's changing dramatically. So for us to, to discriminate in the way that you're going to, you're going to watch the, um, the Crown, or a show that's on Hulu, or on Amazon Prime, or the next basement company that's going to become Netflix, it's political. It's, 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 a, it's a suicide. It's very interesting, but I'm still not getting. I'm still not getting where the fear is going to be alleviated, and that there isn't going to be a financial burden placed on individuals going around. I, I don't. The fear is really. It, it troubles me as not only in my in my personal life, in my in my professional life, but my personal life. There's so much fear and there's unknown about what's happening behind the curtain of the internet that I think drives a lot of hostility. And I think we're the number one target right now. And I shake my head oftentimes and say, I wish people understood the whole story. And I wish we had done a better job of articulating what our role is. I think you're doing a great job. Well, thank you. That. But I mean, beyond tonight. <laughs> I mean, beyond me. I mean, beyond me, but thank you. It seems to me that it's you all can come with some type of guarantee to the table that if it's not what you are presenting, presenting it to be, that folks can go back to the way it was and, or to some other opportunity that would be as good or better than what you are. Exhibit A of my testimony lays out the open internet transparency rule that, they, that all these companies have to publicly promote what their um, policies are, exhibit B, is Cox remains committed to net neutrality rules. And the logical end is, so your question is, if they violate this, Attorney General, Federal Trade Commission, the, the, the Federal Communications Commission, and the Department of Justice. A full administration, the federal administration, our administration, or who's going to enforce that? Each individual agency. So, and if you say, well, Trump, Excuse me, President Trump, he oversees the Department of Justice, they're never going to do that. Well, quite frankly, there are two things I will say. One, they're blocking um, AT&T's attempt to purchase all of Time Warner in terms of content. And so it's not like they're leaving all of us alone. I think it's quite the opposite. I think they're saying, no, that's antitrust. We're not going to allow that to happen. Number two, there was just a case two weeks ago in the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit, which is which doesn't tend to be pro-business if you look at all the circuits, right? This is California. They upheld the FTC's, against AT&T as well, the FTC's authority to both investigate and bring enforcement actions. So they just confirmed and reaffirmed the FTC's ability to come after us. So there are, there are powerful tools. Some people say they may not be nimble enough. I guarantee you, if you were to call the Attorney General of this state, who have had the privilege of meeting a couple times, I know his office would... Um, would investigate any of our members or any of the people who are not members if we violated that trust. Because it's, it's a public trust. And it's also a legally binding agreement that we have to make with you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you.